This episode of the Model 3 Owners Club podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage on your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1-855-385-4226 or visit our website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, it's time again for the Model 3 Owners Club podcast and I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. We have something very special planned for you tonight. We're going to do something a little different, but we'll get into that a little bit later. First, I want to bring in my guest. As usual, I have Mr. Eric Camacho and Ian Pavelko. Thanks for joining in, guys. How you been? I am well. Good evening, everyone. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in, guys. Um, we want to start off a little bit with uh, just talking about uh, a little bit of a milestone. I'm just going to toot my own horn here <laughs> a little bit. Don't mean to do that. Uh, yeah. Go for it, Trev. Um, the Model 3 Owners Club has actually surpassed uh, 1 million page views sustained per month. Hey, look at this graphic. Isn't that fun? Um, you know what? This has been going on since actually about August. I just wanted to make sure that it was consistent before I actually revealed the information. Um, we've seen an incredible amount of growth since the start of this year. And I attribute that, of course, to Model 3 actually shipping now. Uh, so I want to say a big thanks. Yeah, I want to say a big thanks to everybody, uh, all the members, all the lurkers, you know, everybody all over the world that comes out to, to look at the, uh, at the website. Because without the eyeballs, it doesn't matter. So I want to say a big thanks to everybody for that. <sighs> it's been a long, long time coming. And, and, you know, I've been looking at the analytics, and the growth is just continuing on this just continuous ramp. Now, it's not a hockey stick, but it's just consistent growth month after month after month. We're seeing lots and lots of new members joining and stuff, mainly because people just want to come in and just say, I got my delivery. What do I need to know? <laughs> So, anyways, having said that, want to get in and talk a little bit about some Tesla news before we get into the juicy stuff that we want to get into tonight. So, I'm just going to uh, rattle off a little bit of stuff that just happened today. So, Tesla actually announced a new uh, board, a, a chairman, chairperson of the board that's been uh, appointed. Her name is Robin Debholm, and she is currently the CFO and head of strategy at Telstra, uh, which is Australia's largest telecommunications company. She served um, on the Tesla board as an independent director since, 24, uh, since 2014. So she's been around for a little bit. So she knows the ropes. Um, she was also the chief financial officer, uh, chief financial and operations officer at Juniper Networks for nine years. And she said today um, in the press release from Tesla, she says, I believe in this company. I believe in its mission and look forward to helping Elon and the Tesla team achieve sustainable profitability and drive long-term shareholder value. And I think this is a really big deal because if you look at oh, yeah. Elon's two biggest companies, they have very prominent, um, powerful women in their positions. If you look at SpaceX, they got uh, Gwyn Shotwell, who is mm -hmm. the person who's really running the show down there. And now they've appointed, um, you know, this new chairperson. Of course, because as part of the settlement with the SEC, Elon had to step down as chairman of the board. He gets to stay as CEO for at least. Um, for the foreseeable future, he just can't be chairman of the board for at least three years. So, finally, coming apparently, through on this. Now he's nothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> Elon, I like that one. you know, te yeah, Tesla, Tesla's not Tesla without Elon somewhere in there. But I've always said this, you know, publicly, and we've mentioned it on the show and stuff. I really believe that Tesla really should have some kind of chief operating officer, much like Gwyn runs the show at, at SpaceX. And that really allows Elon to focus on other things. He's, he's, just, he's just spread too thin. He's a better guy at running, you know, see, dealing with the problems, um, you know, doing the engineering and the design. That's what he really likes to do. I think if you were to take, take him out of the mix as far as running the company on a, day, a daily operation. Now, I'm not saying the chairman of the board actually does this. I'm just saying that. Uh, what am I saying? I'm just saying that I think the, 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 they should have another person involved as well. So yeah. they, I think they said they, they were supposed to appoint at least, was it uh, two other independent people? So mm -hmm. they haven't announced that yet, so we're looking forward to seeing what they do with that. But anyways, all, all things said and done, I think it's a really great appointment. So looking forward to seeing um, what, what she can bring to the table. Eric, I do you want to add, I, I was yeah, going to say, I want to add one thing here that's very important. So um, 
first of all, there's this is something to be very proud about uh, with SpaceX and Tesla to see two women in such very high ranking positions in the company uh, to be at their respective posts. Uh, but bear in mind, there's not a lot of women in power across major North American companies. So uh, the thing I think to take from this is that there is still room for growth within Tesla to have much more diversity at the very top of the executive positions. Uh, same goes for many other companies across North America. This is not exclusive to Tesla by any means. But it also lets ladies know that you are able to work your way up and reach such prominent plateaus. So if you are someone who aspires to sort of follow uh, Gwen's and Robin's footsteps, well, they're blazing that path for you. Uh, so keep treading forward, uh, keep your head high, uh, keep doing what you want to do, uh, and, and know that opportunities are there, uh, even though we all can do better at giving those opportunities to women as equal as they are to men. I agree. Excellent. Uh, well, that uh, takes care of that a little bit. There is some other stuff that just broke today, of course. Uh, track mode. Finally confirmed. Track mode is now being sent out to all the performance Model 3s. And, it, and um, that includes performance Model 3s with or without the performance package. <laughs> Ian, I want you to chime in on this because, uh, you know, you're the guy with the performance Model 3. Uh, who, finally, who, finally. Yes, who bought the big expensive performance upgrade option so he could have track mode. But of course, they've democratized it now and everybody gets it. Okay. But Did you I've actually get it. it on your car? Just as I was doing a test drive tonight for my stepdaughter, who had just seen the car for the first time tonight, and just as we're about to take off, it says, there's a new update available. Would you like to download it? I'm like, it's got to be now. <laughs> Don't. Oh. Yeah, because I mean, I had exactly enough time to do that and then race in here to, to catch you guys for the podcast. So uh, I've scheduled it for tonight. We'll we'll see if that's what it is. I didn't even have time to see the description or whatever. So uh, I'm assuming that's what it is. Um, but yes, I wait with bated breath to finally flip that on and see what it does. Did you have a chance to look at the release notes that Tesla put out on their website? Yes, I read them about six times over, okay. and I can say they were outstandingly written. It's um, it's a very good narrative. Um, I think for all of us who are really interested in it, most everybody would have read the uh, Road and Track test, uh, where they had a couple of performance cars out at Lime Rock and uh, beat the snot out of them for a better part of a day. And I thought that was an excellent insight into what the system does. You had uh, two of the top chassis guys from Tesla there talking about it and that was great too you never get to see behind the scenes to that level you know you on the financial calls we hear some of the top executives you know in terms of technology we don't really get far past jb straubel and he's always a great guy to to listen to but this is the first time we had some chassis people giving it to us straight and uh i wouldn't be surprised if they had a hand in writing um that press release because it was very very detailed and it gave you an excellent sort of organic feel for what it does and just briefly, for, for those of you who might not be aware, um, the track mode in this car is different in one major way. In, in most other sports cars, sports coupes, GTs, whatever, that have some sort of performance setting for, um, for, for performance driving. And just to give you a quick overview, that's, it changes the settings usually for the electronic stability control, which keeps the car from spinning or sliding, and to some degree the traction control as well, so that you can get the car a little bit sideways, you know, have a bit of fun with it, and in most cases, achieve a faster lap time. You know, a car that's very tightly controlled from a stability control standpoint, it's not going to be the quickest car around the track. It'll be very safe, but it won't necessarily give you the quickest time because you're restricting some of the key uh, shifts in the car's momentum, you know, nose to tail and oversteer, understeer, this sort of thing. So to get it as fast as possible, you want to give it a little bit wider berth and when it moves around on the track so most other systems slowly deactivate you know they kind of go into a sport mode where you can get the car a bit sideways and in some of them you have like a full race mode where you can turn everything off and now you're master of your destiny if you spin completely you're going off the track end of story what tesla system does is it uses the computer to give you a much wider berth you have a lot more range of movement but it's always on it's constantly monitoring what you're doing and what it's trying to do is enhance so if it sees at a certain point if you're trying to dive in towards the apex of a corner and maybe you're understeering a little it'll put more torque to the rear to bring the back end of the car around likewise if you're tr slowing down for a corner and the same thing's happening it can shift the torque um, from the uh, from the regen more to the front or more to the rear. And it can do this all, you know, in thousands of a second time. So this car is going to have capabilities 
They're described in the press release as superhuman. I don't think that's too far <laughs> of a stretch. You're, you're, it's going to take someone who's a very average driver around the track and make them a level better, is, is my impression of how this is going to work if it's true to form. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what they can pull off with this because, you know, doing this stuff through software at the millisecond level without any kind of mechanical linkages or playing with transmissions and stuff is just going to make yeah. this thing a monster. I mean, going forward, when they start doing more of this stuff, like, because... You know, the Model 3, if you look at it, is the first car where they've actually done anything. They've never done a track mode for the Model S. Um, no. So, I knew I've been begging for it for years. Well, I know. Exactly. So what we're looking at here is a lot of the stuff is being developed on this test bed, Model 3, so that eventually when they get around to doing some kind of update to the Model S, it's just going to inherit all of this stuff. And, I mean, the Model 3 performance is certainly no slouch of a car, but to see, uh, you know, P100D Ludicrous with that kind of mode is just going to eat everything alive. It's just going to be crazy. But you have to tell me the truth, though, Ian, because I know you, you just want uh, this mode so you can drift this thing, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Are you kidding? <laughs> I, I've, I've developed a new hashtag for it. I call it Electrohooning. Electro. <laughs> I think I saw that. That was quite yes. clever of you. I'm yeah. Okay, well, we'll have to one. use that. I should yes. mention, um, I reached out to uh, Sasha Annis, who's the guy who runs uh, Mountain Pass Performance that you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's down in Button Willow, California. He told me that they just got the update just before they started racing. So uh, hopefully we'll get some numbers from him in the next few days, or when he gets back. Anyways, I'll have a chat with him. And uh, I, I want to get his take on that. Maybe I'll have him on the show sometime, and he can tell us some, you know, because he's a track guy. So yeah, we definitely should. Show. He'd be yeah. great. To, uh, well, he, he doesn't live very far from me, so uh, maybe I'll have him over sometime. And we'll do a podcast with him, so be looking forward to that. All right. Uh, yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about your Tesla tap, though? Because you just had your two wall connectors installed at the house, because, you know, for those of you who don't know, Ian has not only a Performance Model 3, but he also has a Chevy Volt with a V. Um, so tell us a little bit about your installation and that handy-landy little doodad that you have in your hand you brought in today. Yes, I'd be glad to. There's been quite a few questions and interest in this because I'm not the only one. I, I have a feeling a lot of our uh, listeners, viewers, and people out in the EV community in general have um, bioelectric households. You know, they have a Tesla and something else. So, um, you know, it presents a bit of a challenge when you want to install chargers for these cars. What do you get? You know, do you get something, a standard off the shelf, you know, universal type charger, uh, which obviously the Tesla can work with. It can work with any type of, of level two home charger. Um, or do you get a Tesla charger for your Tesla and then, you know, a, a standard level level two SAE connector, whatever, for your Volt or your Leaf or whatever else you're driving. And in my case, I looked at all the possibilities and I quickly came to the conclusion that the best value by far is to actually buy two Tesla wall connectors for the simple reason is uh, dollar for amperage output, they're a steal. Yes, they um, are. They're $500 US, $633 Canadian, and you can pull up to 72 amps of current out of one of these things. I mean, in any other type of conventional uh, wall connector, you'd be paying upwards of $1,000 or more to get that kind of current capacity if you can get it at all. You know, even a standard 32 amp unit, a good one is $800 and up. Yep. Um, now, the problem is, what do you do to connect it to your non-Tesla? Um, Actually, before you get into that, I want to yeah. make sure that people understand. Now, I, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't know how you have it hooked up, but one of the things that the Tesla wall connector can do is daisy yep. chain up to four of them together on a single circuit. Yeah, you beat me to the punch. I was ah. just about to talk well, about that. because that's an, Yeah, we sort of have to set, set it up. What's the, the rationale here? Okay, go ahead. So even if you bought two regular um, wall chargers uh, from some other, you know, a, a standard um, charging unit, the problem you're going to have is you've got to build the circuit that supplies them to make sure that it can supply enough amperage to feed two of them. So if you if you get your standard 32 amp charger, which is a fairly common size, you would need uh, at least an 80 amp uh, wire and fuse to feed it because the way it works is whatever the line is coming from your fuse box, uh, you can only use 80% of that current. So Correct. if you've got an 80 uh, amp circuit, you can only actually run 64 amps of current into the cars divided by two that gives you a 32 amps so you need like a, at least an 80 amp circuit on the house and a lot of people you know 
their panel's pretty full, you can't necessarily pull that much power. Uh, in my case, I have a 200 amp entry. I was comfortable pulling 60 amps and uh, I can put 48 into the Model 3 and I can put 16 into the Volt, but that poses a problem, right? That that totals to um, 64 amps and I'm only allowed to use 48. Well, the test the wall connectors, as Trevor uh, mentioned, can be daisy chained. That is, you can put up to four of them all on the same circuit and they will talk to one another and they will figure out the load by themselves. And I've had endless amounts of fun the last two nights plugging the different cars and different configurations and different states of charge to see what they do. And they react instantaneously. So you never have to worry. So I've set the, the main one to say, okay, you can't pull more than 48 amps. And then the slave unit uh, understands that and they will basically divvy up the load depending on what's plugged in. So when my Model 3 is plugged in by itself and is full on hungry, I bang, in we go, full 48 amps instantly. The minute I add the volt and plug it in, the Model 3 will now drop to 32 amps so as to not exceed the total amount of current available. So Model 3 still gets 32, the Volt gets 16. If you had two Model 3s, it would wind up splitting 24-24. And whichever car fills up first or starts to taper, the remaining amperage starts to creep up. So it's constantly juggling between the two cars to give whoever what needs, depending on you know, what's going on. And, and I, it's, it's communication. Fantastic. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, and the communication happens because you run a wire, a communication wire between the two. It's like Ethernet or something like that. Just, to, uh, I forget how many wires on that because I, I don't have my manual with me. But there is a connection method that you do between the two. It's just an extra wire you put in so that they can talk yep. to another. So just in case people ask because they're going to say, well, how are they communicating? Is it wireless? Is it? No, no, it's a, it's a, it's like a wire, right? Yeah. It's, it's real simple. The, the install is you basically have to have a junction box and you, you just tie the two sets of wires together. They're basically just spliced together so that you have one wire coming out of your main feed. And in my case in the garage, I have a junction box where they split off. One side feeds one wall unit, one spits the other. And then there's a, an 18 gauge two conductor wire that feeds between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Basically it looks like speaker wire and uh, with better insulation. And that is what communicates. It's basically a positive and a negative. It's a little DC signal. And that's what tells each unit what to do based on what the master is reading and, and telling it. So the last piece of the puzzle is um, this little guy here. Because of course, as we said, the, uh, the Tesla connector will not fit in the Volt. So you need something to adapt it. So this is where I found, there's a few different people who make these, but this is by far the best one I found. And it's something called a Tesla tap see the little logo here on the camera. Can we get that here? Is it going to focus? Here we go. So what you're looking at is basically a standard J1772 connector on the front end. This is what's going to plug into the car. It's a really nice handle. It's got uh, a little rubber weather protector that fits on. So if you're using it outdoors, it stays nice. protected when it's hanging. Yeah, it's got a nice sturdy um, locking mechanism on it. But it's the back end of it that's a real work of art. This is uh, looks to be like a hands uh, machined or CNC machined um, billet aluminum connector that goes into the business end of the Tesla connector. So, it's a and, so for those of you who are, who are listening to the podcast who can't see this. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we got to make that point, right? Because lots of people true. are listening true, true. instead of uh. seeing. Um, so, so the other end is a female connector for the Tesla wall connector or a UMC. Have you t actually Ian, have you t have you tested it with the UMC or is it just the wall connector you've done so far? I've just done it with the wall connector. Okay, I'm I'm going to say it's UMC compatible too. Be well, physically, anyways, but uh, electronically, well, we hope so, anyways. Um, but yeah, it allows you to take your Tesla wall connector and plug it into this adapter, so you can charge any electric car that has a standard 1772 connector on the yep. other end. And the exactly. whole contraption is what about two feet long or so. Oh, not even. Maybe about uh, 18 inches. It's, oh, okay. it's very compact, yeah. Okay. Carry on. Yeah. So um, in my particular case, I had ordered the 32-amp unit because the Volt doesn't need that much. And uh, I got a free upgrade to 40 amps. And um, I didn't even plug anything. I was just, you know, Joe Average. And they said, hey, you're getting a complimentary 40-amp unit. And I think they make them even to higher ratings. So uh, I, I can't think of too many cars with a 1772 plug that can use more than 40 amps. But no. there you are. Uh, but anyway. Pro approximate cost? Uh, $229 US. Oh, that's reasonable. Um, 
yeah, I, I think it's very reasonable. I mean, again, added to the cost of the wall connector, it just brings you back to where you'd be, you know, with a really good quality standard J1772 unit. But you have this advantage that you can share between the cars, and uh, no matter how little or how much current you have available, it divvies it up. It just makes it a completely mindless process. Yeah, I've seen it before. Uh, Kenneth Bacor, who used to be on the show with us when, when we were doing the um, EV Resolution show together, uh, he bought a 2018 Nissan Leaf, and of course he had a Tesla wall connector he had installed because... Um, uh, before he changed his mind and, and went with the Leaf, um, he had bought that to plug in his Tesla. So even that combined, as you say, with the Tesla tap adapter, works perfectly fine. I talk to him every day. He says, never a problem. I just plug it in. The darn thing just works. So, yeah, it's a really good value, I think. Yeah, and as a bonus for someone, you know, like um, like Ken, who can, you know, travel and use destination chargers, we would never bother with the Volt, although you could. But uh, yeah, if, if, if you wind up somewhere that's got a Tesla destination charger and you're driving something else, you know, as long as they give you permission, you can plug in and you can, you can charge there too. It, it's also important to note that even though the port is compatible with the supercharger, it doesn't work with the supercharger. This is strictly yeah. level two. Yeah, yeah, correct. So we have to be, make that very clear because you've got people saying, oh, I can plug in a supercharger and I can charge uh -huh. my leaf. That's not going to happen. Sorry, folks. No. Okay. Well, good. Thank you for that report. I really like that. I mean, you know, I, I've said it before. I think the Tesla wall connector is absolutely the best deal going around, all things considered, when you take everything into account as far as level twos, EVSEs, whatever you're looking at. You know, don't even bother. Just buy the Tesla one. It's absolutely the best deal. Speaking of which, I want to get onto the next little bit here because there was another little bit of information I found, and, and I found this on the Model 3 Facebook group. Um, there was a Model 3 that was spotted in Germany at Tesla Groman. This is the engineering uh, company that Tesla bought last year. And somebody has snapped a picture, and I'll put it up here for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And it has a different connector. I'm going to try and zoom in here. Sorry, but the quality is not the best. Um, they've camouflaged this connector. And I've done a little bit of enhancing on my end with Photoshop, and I was able to zoom in. And what I see is a standard SAE Level 2 Menikees or Minikees, however they pronounce it, which is the standard connector that they use in Europe. And I know a lot of people have said, you know, is Tesla going to do CCS in Europe and stuff? And the answer is, is very simple. The answer is no. The reason is, is that the Model 3 that's going to be shipping in Europe has to be compatible with the existing supercharger, te Tesla supercharging network. And they all use the standard Type 2 connector in Europe. So there's your answer as far as Model 3. It's not to predicate that they can't do it for other countries. And I think it's one of the reasons why Tesla made the charge port on the Model 3 considerably bigger or made the tail light looking housing part of it much, much bigger than the S and the X. Because if you look at China, China has another connector called the GB connector. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a picture here. Um, and the Model S is going, uh, S's and X's going into, uh, into the Chinese market now have a, a door on the side that's actually in the sheet metal. It looks like a gas cap. It, it's horrible because they're trying to be compatible with the Chinese market with this GB connector. So I think in a lot of ways, Tesla was looking down the road, thinking about Model 3 and going to China. We don't want to have to put this ugly door on the side of the car. So why not take the time and actually design the taillight housing to be bigger to actually accommodate that? That's my personal thinking. I'm putting my little armchair engineering hat on. That's my take on that. But um, the fact that they're actually testing this uh, is boding well uh, because they said that production in Europe is supposed to start somewhere around the January time frame, delivery starting in you know February, March uh, time frame. So the fact that they're, they're testing this is, is very encouraging. So for those of you looking at that, yeah, it's going to be a Type 2 connector. I know it's hard to see in the pictures, but uh, that's just my personal feeling. So. Yeah. Let me just jump in one quick more thing Please on uh, the charging. Uh, Utrev, I think, were the one to discover this. We uh, we got a nice little gift this week. A gentleman by the name of uh, Iktidar Ali um, has posted the complete Model 3 parts catalog online. You can actually look up every single part for the Model 3. It's like 306 pages in a PDF form. Uh, you can go, um, if you look on my Twitter feed, you'll find it there. I don't know if anyone's posted to the form yet. Uh, I, I have the link. He it. sent it to me. I'll put it in the in the show description. Yes, um, in please the notes. do. I'll, I'll put That's it in there so you guys can check it out. Because if you look at the Tesla website to look at these parts, it's very obtuse. It's not easy to use. So mm -hmm. uh, he wrote some scripts or whatever and had some help and uh, basically downloaded all those and put them all into a single PDF. Hopefully he doesn't get into trouble for that, but uh, we'll link yeah. to it anyways. 
Yeah, for while it's there, it's it's definitely worth looking at. I mean, to me, it was like huge technical porn. I just spent like an hour lunchtime there going over it. It was fantastic. Well, I started but digging through it, of course, and then this is what we're talking about here is finally. Yeah. Tell us what you found. Well, I mean, you, you might as well tell us because you started the whole conversation. <laughs> okay. Um, it looks like they've listed the Chatamo adapter for Model 3. And for those of us who live in Chatamo heavy areas, this is good news because it means hopefully at some point they're officially going to support it. I, I really hope it's just a software update to get the thing going. So I did some poking around talking to different people and I have some other people that are a little closer and they've definitely told me that it is compatible with the car. It's just they're waiting for a software update. And uh -huh. basically it was put to me, do you want enhanced autopilot features or do you want Chatamo? Take your pick. Can't have both right now. Uh -huh. They're just, they're spread a little too thin. So, uh, yeah, that's what's really going on. That's kind of what I assumed for a long time is that it's priorities at this point. Yeah. And um, my personal experience, even though I do have a Chatmo adapter and I used it for the very first time this past weekend when I was in Ottawa, because um, <laughs> as nice as we have a lot of superchargers in this area, in Ottawa, there's only one and it's at the Rideau Center downtown and you have to pay for parking and it's way at the bottom. It's very inconvenient for where I was staying with friends. So just on a whim, I said, you know what? I don't want to live on this 120 volt connection at your friend's at my friend's place for forever. I said, let's just do a quick charge somewhere. So I pulled up PlugShare and I found um, a Chatmo, a uh, yeah, a charging st a station, a Circuit Electric a charging station. I went in and I spent about, and I, I you know, I'm sorry about this. this. is a little bit of a rant here, but <laughs> I spent a good half hour trying to get and I had all the apps on my phone I got this little folder and I've got all the little you know I got my EV you know I got my EV co go card for the US and I've got all these things in my phone and I spent half an hour trying to activate um, the darn charger <laughs> because I had to add funds to my account like it you know even though you put your credit card on phone uh, you, you have to add funds and then uh, oh god it was a nightmare uh, I got a charge the maximum I ever saw out of that damn Chatmo adapter was 34 kilowatt so wow. it was not fun, let me tell you. So Yeah, it, yeah, that was the I, same I, night I think I was tweeting out bragging I was getting 116 at the one at Fairview from the supercharger. Ex <laughs> like, exactly. Dude, so, you know, we're, we are very, very spoiled with the supercharging network. Um, yes, I, I'm all for having alternatives out there. Just be prepared that Chatable is, um, is, at, is at, at best... Uh, from my experience on this, it's, it's about a third of the speed is what you're going to get on a supercharger. So it helped. It was great. It was better than hanging the car off 120 volt for three days to get a decent charge out of it. But yeah, uh, my experience was not very fun on that. I tweeted out a picture if you want to look at it. Look at my Twitter, my Twitter feed and stuff. I, I'm very thankful that they are there. Thank you very much, Silky Electric and Flow. Great. Charge point wherever, you know, because they have partnerships with those guys. Actually, that's how I started. I actually started trying to use my charge point account because I have an agreement with them. Couldn't get it to work. So I had to pull up my flow account and then, you know, get money put in. Anyways, make a long story short, it was, it was, I got it working. It was just not a pleasant, fun experience. So hopefully in the future, and I th I'm going to attribute that partly because the internet connection where I was in that parking lot was really, really bad. It was dropping in and out. So. <laughs> wasn't in the best best place i you know had i had my account already set up and and stuff i'm sure it would have been a lot lot easier if, if you're going to be using it semi-regularly and around in montreal they're fantastic because there's level two and, and chatmo chargers everywhere yes i i recommend getting the card i mean it's only a few bucks you can order the card from circuit electric and that works 100 percent of the time as long as the unit is active i've never had a problem the apps can be a little bit wonky like you say depending <clears> on uh connections but if you've got the actual chip card bang it just goes good good point i'm going to do that i'm going to get on my card after this and i'm going to go to order one <laughs> highly <laughs> recommend that fine lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your tesla's paint leather carpet plastic and wheels effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla. We were meant for each other. All right. Well, <clears throat> now they get the Tesla news out of the out of the deal. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something different, and it's something that I've been 
having in the back of my mind for a little while because um, at this point, it's going to be pure speculation. The next product coming out of Tesla is really about Model Y. Now, Model Y is not what we're talking about tonight. I just wanted to put that out there because a lot of people think, oh, you're going to be talking about Model Y. No. Tonight, I want to talk about pickup trucks because Elon's got a new pet project and it's a pickup. So... <laughs> I spent a little bit of time in preparation for the podcast tonight to get myself a little bit educated on pickup. Pickups has never been my thing, but, you know, after listening to the Kara Swisher Recode Decode podcast, now if you haven't listened to it, I'll put a link in the video description or the or the podcast, and you can actually listen to it yourself. I think most people who really follow Elon have actually listened to it. It's about 80 minutes long. And in there, I mean, I mean, he talks about a lot of different things. Um, but you can tell he has some enthusiastic um, thing going on for this pickup. He really says, this is my new favorite pet project. And some. Some. Well, yeah, it is. It's, it's crazy. Um, you know, the Model Y, in a lot of ways, in my opinion, is that it's, it's largely buttoned up. I mean, they have the design. It's going into production as far as the first prototype. So largely, it's, it's done. How much more engineering they have to do before they actually go into production is unknown. In the Model uh, 3, it was basically another six months before they had to have that button down. So they're well on their way on that project. So, you know, most of his efforts now are on the pickup because if you look at the semi Semi's in the same position. The Roadster largely is in the same position. Those are, uh, they're at the engineering prototype stage at this point. They've been putting lots of miles, at least on the Tesla Semi. So now they're on to the next thing. And it's really about this pickup. So like I said, in preparation, I started to get um, some information on this because I want to talk about, you know, this new market. And, you know, Tesla doesn't seem to get into a lot of markets. They just want to get into things that they think that they can make a difference. So... Would you believe that um, there have been more than 1.4 million pickup trucks that have been sold for the first half of this year alone? That's that's a crazy market. So the three top best-selling trucks in North America, and and uh, and I'm I'm going to put this out there a little bit. Um, pickup trucks are very much a North American thing. It's not like they're not sold in other countries. They use them on farms a lot in in Australia and stuff, but they're very much a North American thing. So the large, the you know, the largest in installed base of pickup trucks really is in North America. So the 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 three top selling pickups are the uh, Ford F uh, F series the Chevrolet Silverado, and, of course, the Ram. Now, there are other makes in there that sell some cars as well. Um, you know, you got the Honda Ridgeline and the Nissan Titan. We'll talk about that in a second. So, trucks have the uh, the greatest year-of-year -year improvement in 2018 are the GMC Canyon, which is another uh, different type of pickup they make, the, uh, the Chevrolet Co uh, Colorado, and the uh, Toyota Tacoma. Interesting that they name a lot of these cars after places. Um in fact, uh, che uh, Chevrolet's Colorado year-over-year -year, uh, sales have risen a whopping uh, almost 39% compared to this time in 2017. I don't know why. Maybe because it doesn't have that typical look. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but you can look it up yourself. And uh, the, I, I can interject there, Trev. There's a little bit of a movement now to the midsize pickup because they're not... Um, not a full size. That's right? not a full size. No, exactly. It, it competes <laughs> with the Tacoma. And uh, to some degree, the Nissan Frontier, but that's getting a little bit long in the tooth. It's due for yeah. a redesign soon. And um, that I think a lot of people now are starting to want to downsize. For a while, the U.S. manufacturers had gotten out almost completely of the compact and midsize pickups because they just weren't doing every, you know, for a, a couple of thousand dollars more, you could buy a full size. It didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But I think now with fuel prices on the rise and uh, in certain places, people just not having the room for them, these these new midsize designs are taking off. Ford's about to reintroduce the Ranger. So that's sort of to explain, I think, what's going on there yeah. a little bit. So just some other numbers real quick. Uh, the Honda Ridgeline, which we'll talk about because it's a unique um, design compared to everybody else. They saw the largest year-of-year -year decline. Uh, their sales are down almost 20% compared to 2017. I don't know why. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, just just for curiosity's sake, in the in the least position in terms of sold cars, the Honda Ridge line is coming in at uh, fourteen thousand nine hundred eighty-eight sold in twenty eighteen. Um, the number, the other one I picked out was the Nissan Titan, uh, coming in at the ninth position at twenty-three thousand two hundred ninety-four. Now the other three, which are the top three, you got the Ram coming in third place, two hundred thirty-three thousand five hundred thirty-nine <laughs> examples. The Chevrolet Silverado number two position at 291,074. And the Ford F1 uh, F Series, the number one seller, is 451,138 examples. 
Eh, it seems like a lot, right? <laughs> We're talking like more model, more than model threes. Uh, you know, in terms and of those are market. partial year numbers, right, Trev? Y- yeah, it's only the first half of 2018. So yeah, we're I was going to say, because they, they normally sell about 800,000 a year. Exactly. In the US. We're, we are really talking over, you know, over probably close to 2 million cars uh, a year. So it's a huge yeah. market um, in terms of unit sales. Now, we know Tesla is not a company that competes in the low end of anything. They really like to start at the high end. So I decided, what is Elon planning for this car? So I went back and looked at some of the first mentions, which was in June, uh, June 26th of this year. He went on a, a, a bit of a Twitter rampage or a, t- a tweet storm, as he as he's wont to do from time to time. And uh, he basically tried to crowdsource a little bit. What would you like to see in a pickup truck? And in some of that tweet storm, there was some very interesting information that came out of it. Now, for those of you who didn't follow, I'm going to give you some of these these bits. So he said the car is going to have seating for six. Now, he didn't specify whether that's a base model or an advanced model. And I want to put that caveat on everything that I'm going to give you here. He just put out these things. He just put out these numbers and these specs. We don't know where it lies in the product lineup. So just take that with a grain of salt. So seating for six. An official towing capacity of 300,000 pounds. <laughs> now, if you help. think that's ridiculous, the Model X has been already de- uh, demonstrated, even though it has an official towing capacity of 5,000 pounds, it has been demonstrated to pull a muck cart out of the boring tunnel channel, uh, the boring tunnel company, or uh, tunnel down in Hawthorne, sorry. Um, there's a video, you can look it up, that Elon posted, and it was pulling uh, 250,000 pounds. They have another video that it was towing in a, a, a jet aircraft on the tarmac. So, an A380 Airbus, I think. Um, I don't think it was quite that big, but uh, yeah, it was it was an airliner. It was pretty big. Something big. So yeah, it's not it's not out of the ordinary to be able to have uh, this kind of towing capacity. You know, it's just like that old... Uh, you know, saying, you know, I can pull one ton, I can pull two tons, I can pull an aircraft carrier. Like, who needs that? But, yeah. you know, some people want to be able to do that. Is that like a name that tune sort of bravado? <laughs> like, I can name that song in four notes. I can name that song in one note. But then, but in terms of like trucks. Yeah. That's that's li- like different. But that's literally how they market them. I mean, and I have to deal with this continuously because in the alloy wheel business it's critical that we build wheels that can handle the load capacity of the trucks and it's going up and up and up and the numbers we're seeing for the axle ratings now are insane and it's really just basically my truck's bigger than your truck nobody really often needs to tow twenty one thousand pounds with their pickup (laughs) well was it didn't didn't toyota have that commercial where they were towing the space shuttle oh probably uh, I think so. There was GM had one when they launched uh, the new Allison transmission in, in the full size truck many years ago, where they were towing what looked like a smaller version of the Titanic out of the ocean with it. I mean, this is this is what works. This is what appeals to this market. I mean, you know, you can't argue. Yeah, it's it's the you know. Meanwhile, the only thing these guys are going to put in the back of their trucks are like lawn equipment. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'll buy a pickup because I might need to pull. You know, I might need to bring a sheet of plywood home someday. So. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm not making fun of the pickup people. They it, they they are great vehicles for what they do. Um, everybody has a need for different things, and there there is some innovation. I'll, I'll I'll get into that here in a little bit. There is some some interesting innovations going on in the pickup world. But I want to get back into some of these specs here before we uh, we really get off on a tangent here. So um, Elon made a big uh, splash about the design of this thing um, during the uh, Kara Swisher podcast. He says. I want to do a Blade Runner cyberpunk uh, futuristic design. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea. I'm going to put up a picture here for those of you who might have remembered at the reveal event last year uh, when Tesla brought out the semi-truck and, of course, the roadster out of the back. He did flash a picture up of uh, a pickup truck concept based on the cab of the um, of the semi-truck, and they they playfully showed, I think, a picture of another pickup truck, a regular pickup truck, in the bed of this thing. So... Um, this is not realistic, but it might give us some indication as to what they're kind of thinking of uh, going forward. So this is just a concept drawing. I don't think they actually built the thing, but it's interesting to see that um, they are certainly thinking, um, you know, design-wise. Because let's face it, if you really think about the pickup market, I mean, they're all pretty much the same. They all look the same thing. You know, LED uh, running lights are all the rage right now. So they've all retrofitted these cars with C-shaped, uh, you know, they're going crazy with the with the lighting thing. 
So, yeah, that'll be interesting to see. And, of course, with Franz on board, you know the thing's going to be gorgeous. But how far is he going to go? We don't know. He even said in the podcast, says, I don't know if people are actually going to buy this thing, but I don't care. I still want to make it. I mean, obviously. <laughs> I mean. That was great. Yeah. Well, obvi- obviously, they have to make money on this thing. Um, and he even said, you know, if it's too crazy, maybe we'll make something a little bit simpler down the road, whatever. But, you know, he just wants to do what he wants to do. All right, with so a more, lot of with a lot of titanium, as yes, it were. Yes, exactly. Well, yeah. Where is he going to use the titanium? I have no idea. I would think it was probably some kind of skid plate on the bottom of this thing, because if you're going to jack it up and you're going to go off roading with it and stuff, it's going to have to be pretty solid on the bottom. Um, right. Other information: power outlets allowing heavy duty 240 volt uh, power tools with no generator required. Bonus. Why not? We're, we're talking about trucks. They're going to be heavy duty. They're going to be used on job sites. Um, you got a big battery pack? Sure. Put some voltage outputs on there so you can plug in your uh, your air compressors, your your welders. I mean, I think a lot of people are really going to like that because there's, I mean, there's no other pickup that has anything like that on the market. You'll be, you'll be driving the world's largest cordless drill. Yeah, exactly. Um, he did say that uh, standard on all the cars will be dual motor, all wheel drive. That's kind of a given these days with Teslas. Um, he also said that st- uh, suspension will that dynamically adjusts for load. Now we don't know if it's air suspension or not. He did say that will be standard. I- again, with the caveat, what te- Elon says and what Tesla delivers sometimes may differ. Um, <clears throat> we still don't have a hitch on the Model Three. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there will be an option for a larger battery that will be anywhere from 400, five, uh, 400 to 500 mile range option. Um, think, uh, think about that for a moment, Trev. Just wh- what are we talking in kilowatt rating for an, you know, a, a machine the size of a truck, like a full-size pickup truck? Uh, you're not going to get the same efficiency as we get with the cars. And I would say it's that- minimum 200 kilowatt hour. I, I gotta think because you know to, we're 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 using seventy five kilowatts to get three hundred miles out of a three. This is gonna have probably three times the drag. I'm thinking. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be a big battery. Yeah, big battery. Um, some other people had li- had elicited other ideas, uh, such as lockers um, in the su- in the uh, in the panels of the box, and he did say that. Um, uh, that would be a very good idea to do. Possibly even some front lockers. This is uh, not unheard of. There are pickups on the market. I mean, the first time I ever saw that was actually somebody had invented, had done a retrofit. And I think one of the companies had bought the idea or whatever. So that is something you can find on some pickups out there is lockers. I mean, it's a lot of wasted space otherwise. So why not use it, right? Um, the other thing that Elon had mentioned, I think it was kind of verbally, um, he said that he wants to do something a little different with the lift gate on the back of the, of, of the pickup. Now, as you know, basically all pickup trucks these days have the standard lift gate that just kind of drops down. Some of them have done innovation things like, uh, step ladders that pop out, uh, Ford even has one where you just pull up a stick and it's like a little grab handle that you can get in. Elon says... What I'd like to do is something like maybe that it rotates on a four-bar linkage and drops down to the ground, much like uh, some of those um, uh, uh, cargo trucks have, you know, where they got the elevator built into the back that lifts up. Yeah. So that would be kind of interesting. If they can pull that off, that would be very innovative. Um, There are, uh, speaking of innovations, there are other things that are happening on the market. Like Ford has this new, have you seen it? It's this new steering mechanism that's built in. uh, I mean, there's a calibration process that works with a camera and you have to put these stickers onto the uh, trailer if you're pulling a boat, whatever. But you can actually steer the car when you put it in reverse with just a little dial on the dash rather than trying to figure out like which Mm -hmm. way of the car. I think that's really cool. And matter of fact, when I saw that, when Elon was doing this thing back on June 26, I threw that in my Twitter feed. I said, hey, how about this thing that Ford's doing? I think that'd be pretty cool. No reason you can't do it. You got autopilot after fall, after all, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's some there's some interesting things going on with there. So having said all this stuff, I, I want to I wanna talk about what you guys think. Um, what what kind of <sighs> disruption do you think that, that Tesla could bring to the market if they do this thing? Considering, you know, their history so far with building cars that are, you know, still vehicles with four wheels and a steering wheel at the end of the day, but they do throw innovation in where it matters. Of course, the safety factor ha- uh, comes in too. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- what do you guys think? I mean, where do you think Tesla is going to be going with this thing? Well, three things I wanted to start off with here. First, and we talked about this before we're taping this podcast, is that 
it, you know, and we mentioned this in our last show that safety is so far been the most prominent issue that Tesla addresses when it comes to designing their cars. And they begin with the weakest point. And we know that there are a lot of great uh, pickup trucks out there, but there are some that when it comes to having accidents uh, are pretty susceptible to some significant damage to both the vehicle and to its passengers. So how Tesla addresses that, how they look at crash test videos and think about design for this, whether they're using the the rig design uh, or the cab design of the semi, or if they have some uh, other components from the Model Y and from some other vehicles, will be interesting uh, seeing that moving forward. The second thing is with anything that Tesla is doing, and this is something that Elon said directly in the podcast with Kara, and it's a great podcast. If you haven't heard it, please go uh, listen to it. It's fantastic. Um, but it was mentioned by him that they're trying to get all these diesel and gasoline vehicles off the road and, and doing so would be uh, a monumental success if they're able to do it. And even if they end up not liking the design or if the design of the, uh, the truck doesn't initially do very well, it's possible they may go to a quote unquote more conventional design at that stage. But I think a lot of people look at the cars that Tesla produces now and think they're just beautifully designed cars. I think with with all of the minds that are building these concepts right now, I, I don't really have any concerns moving forward. I'm sure many of us wouldn't either, that they wouldn't come out with what they believe to be probably the, the best truck they can create from a looks perspective, uh, but more so from a safety and performance perspective. And the last thing is that I think if they're able to produce the kind of vehicle that if it has most of the things that Trevor outlined earlier, that's one hell of a damn truck. I mean, that's in and, and, and Elon even said for people who don't think of ever buying a truck, that is one beautiful truck if that's what happens. So um, it, it's I, I think it's going to really change the the industry a bit um, with Ford going to predominantly SUVs and, and trucks and sort of killing their sedan market, uh, save for the uh, the Mustang. Uh, you know, this is going to probably be some significant competition for General Motors, for um, for Ford and for all those others that are, you know, trying to really dominate that market. I think there's some other things at play here. Um, the other thing, too, is that Tesla can't change the market by themselves. They made that very clear. What mm -hmm. they can do, however, and it's very apparent in the rest of the industry, what they've been able to achieve with Model 3, especially with Model 3, now is that it's a wake-up call for the rest of the industry because if they're not going to take your patents and they're not going to copy you and they're not going to partner with you, the only thing they understand is competition. So Tesla really needs to make something that's very compelling, irrespective of the price. We know that mm -hmm. the pickup truck is not going to be a $25,000 pickup truck. It's just not possible. You don't say. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would I would suspect that the pickup would start probably around seventy five thousand US, which is going to put it in the territory of um, you know like a, a, a Ford Raptor type of thing, right? There's a lot of people that want to buy those fancy pickups. They're not using them as typical pickups. It's just they got a lot of stuff in them and they look really cool. Um, so Tesla is going to bring something to the market. I think for if they do it right, because of the advantages of an electric drivetrain which basically is going to shame them a lot in towing capacity, maybe load capacity. Um, and in terms of functionality, especially with these power outlets that's on the thing, that's just not possible you know, in any other car without some kind of fancy generator on board. And I don't know of any pickup that has um, a built-in generator. I mean, yeah, you can buy a $200 generator and get power, but not something that's going to do 240 volts. Um, that... It'll be a wake-up car. I, I think what's going to happen is that the other manufacturers are going to go, holy crap. <laughs> like, if we don't do something electrified, um, these guys could potentially come in and, and really take some market share away from us. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I think, I, I do think the pickup market is ripe for some disruption. And I hate to use that term because it's just so cliched. But... If you really look at it, I mean, there's some innovation that's going on, but it's little features. It's not overall. It's like, what if we, we just rethink the whole thing from the ground up? And, you know, Tesla coming in with an electrified drivetrain and everything they do just really just changes the whole metric. I mean, performance Model 3, we talked about it. The things you can do in the performance level just through electronics alone without having kind of mechanical linkages. 
Um, you know, what we can't even imagine right now, what is a pickup truck going to do without any kind of drive shafts on this thing? Like, what do we, you know, is it going to give us more ground clearance? Like, that's the first thing that pops in my mind. You'll be able to get maybe more ground clearance on this thing because you're only dealing with half shafts. You're not dealing with these large drive shafts with the distributor mm-hmm. in the middle, right? Huh. It really it's, opens it's, up a lot of different, you know. It is. It's a lot to consider uh, at this stage of the game. And, I, you know, and I, and I, I think that because of how much time there is between now and whenever they want to debut this thing, uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of these questions answered and a lot of advances in technology and batteries and everything else. Um, but it's, it's a good discussion we're having. I know this is sort of a different spin on our show because we're being more speculative than anything in this part of conversations <laughs> on what's already been announced. Um, but, you know, Ian, you're, you're certainly someone who likes to get into performance of vehicles. I mean, that's something you're very much knowledgeable about. Um, what would you say is the thing, uh, of all the stuff being covered tonight that stands out to you the most? Uh, talking about the pickups you're talking about, or like the entire yeah, no i mean really yeah, I mean, sort of where we're going no yeah and I, 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 specifically on the pickup i mean there's there's oh, something yeah, sure. i mean you, you mentioned in terms of like the the necessary performance for this yep. truck and you know w- right now we know that uh you know if tesla builds what could be double the battery capacity of an s or an x today that's that's a pretty significant battery um maybe using some of the technology of the model three batteries being that they're a denser battery pack but um you know what what do you pray tell do you believe is is the next coming of uh of the batteries or the performance of this vehicle well i mean yeah th- th- my back of the envelope math tells me it has to be a- about what trevor guessed i think it's got to be at the upper end it's going to have to be a 200 uh, kilowatt battery or larger because it's i don't think it's that difficult to get the sort of range they're talking about if you have a battery that size i mean um, well they're already getting but, the range if you look at the roadster it's yep. uh you know it's 620 miles on a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack now well i, I mean if you look at the weight and i did some yeah. back of the math myself i mean if you take uh you know 100 kilowatt hour battery pack on a p100d that's 1200 pounds uh, multiply that by two, you know, you're in the 2000 pound range. That means that the rest of the car has got to be pretty light. So maybe they're going, you know, carbon fiber. Of course, on a pickup truck, it matters a little less because it's not about speed and so on and so forth. So no, they're, they're going to have to al- allow a fair amount for the chassis. Maybe that's where the titanium comes in, although it's rather pricey as metals go. Well, but, they can't make um, the whole car out of a titanium. That's just no. ridiculous. No. And we should, we should uh, sort of establish where the boundary is. You cannot go, uh, above the maximum vehicle weight for the category, which uh, gross vehicle weight would be 10,000 pounds. If you exceed that, um, you're going to wind up going into medium class trucks. And now you require a special license and all sorts of inspections. Oh, and very on. interesting. Good point. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that so, up. That's that's going to be the ceiling for the vehicle is it, it can't, you know, exceed 10,000 pounds. And if you if you build the thing to weigh 7,000, that means your remaining cargo capacity is only going to be 3,000, which is pretty good. But in the heavy duty truck range now, when you get into 3,500 series trucks, that's not going to cut it. People actually want to be able to carry more than that. Some of these trucks can carry actually more than that, plus the towing capacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to have to come in, I think, at under 7,000 pounds, um, you know, curb weight. And if we have 2,500 pounds of batteries, that means the chassis, the body, all the equipment, everything else uh, is going to have to stay under 5,000 pounds. So there's some serious engineering challenges. I have no doubt Tesla will be up to it. Um, Certainly the fact that it does not have to have this, you know, 1,500 pound giant, you know, iron lump motor is going to be a huge help in that regard. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. And the other thing too is they have a few unique challenges because we all know that you know EV drivetrains have a huge number of advantages, but there are a few disadvantages when it comes to towing. You get serious penalties anytime you're hauling something that you know detracts from the aerodynamics of the vehicle or adds weight, you know, going uphill and so on. You can be looking at a, a range loss of 20, 30, 40 percent. Um, yeah, which I know. You don't, <laughs> and, and you don't see that with gas. You will see it with a gas vehicle because, but but with you know gas and diesel vehicles being l- so much less efficient from the get go, when you when you make them work harder, they're disproportionately more efficient. In other words, you know if you're getting 20 miles to the gallon with your gas truck empty, it might drop to 15 if you're hauling like some kind of a decent load. You know, so you'll see what you know a 25 percent reduction in your range. But 
I think the EV will see 30, 40 or more. I mean, I remember when uh, I was looking at some of the numbers from uh, Rolf and uh, Silke when they were doing the cross, uh, the Model X cross country, yeah. calling the trailer. And that to me was sort of like, whoa, okay. So, you know, if you really want to do workhorse work with an EV, you need a lot of extra battery capacity. So I, I think this is going to be interesting to see is how far they can push it. Of course, by 2020, uh, I think they'll be getting down to that close to, let's hope, to that magic, you know, $100 per kilowatt number. And that starts to make the economics of a very big pack like that worthwhile. So the rest of it, I'm not worried about. In terms of the towing capacity, the torque, the acceleration, it's going to be a monster. There will be no <laughs> diesel truck on earth that can hold a candle to this thing. That no, I am the least bit worried about. So one of the things that I, I got thinking about, <clears throat> and I don't know why, it was basically during my research when I saw the hit a Honda Ridgeline. There is a I mean, if you look at the top three selling trucks, you know, I got the Ram, they got the Silverado and the F-150. These are all body on frame vehicles. I mean, these trucks have always been body on frame. I'm curious to see, is Tesla going to do the standard thing like everybody else and build a body on frame? Or are they going to do, uh, do something more like a, like the Honda Ridgeline, which was very innovative at the time because it was the only pickup on the market that had a unibody? Right. Mm. Instead of the typical frame. Um, Yeah, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm safety. Like there's so many so many things to consider. Like, does it affect towing? Do you need that frame to actually enable the towing? Much like the semi truck. Um, I I got to think you you do. I mean, you know, of course, they they have they have SpaceX brains that they can reach out to, you know, do all sorts of wild things with, you know, um, enclosed structures. So maybe there's another way around that. Maybe you can make a unibody vehicle that can tow 20,000 pounds, but. Well, don't forget. I mean, as I mentioned, Model X has already been demonstrated to pull 250 and it's unibody. True. Um, But that's in a very specific test. That's really just in a straight line, not over particularly rough ground. And it's not a very dynamic environment. I'm thinking, you know, it's it's, because the big challenge when you're pulling big loads and hauling trailers is it's, you know, it's the tail trying to wag the dog, right? So (laughs) you need something that's going to put up with a lot of twisting and abuse and and what have you. So um, that's that's going to be interesting to see. I wouldn't rule it out. You never know. Maybe they're going to come up with some super heavy-duty honeycomb structure that we hadn't thought of, you know, <laughs> or something really wacky. Like I said, I can see a lot of SpaceX ideas coming into this thing. But uh, if I was a betting man, I'd say they're probably going to do body on frame, but they're going to be using uh, some very interesting materials to keep the weight down would be my guess. Mm-hmm. I also wonder, too, how many seats is it going to have? Is the cab going to fit two people, five people? Well, he did, he did say six. So, I mean, oh, you yeah, know, what, we, I mean, that's, that's well, going to be a big cab. I mean, if you're going to put six I mean, people it's in gotta it's going to be a big cab, but you're going to fit six. But, I mean, again, that could be another thing about the, cha- the design of the challenge of trying to fit that many people uh, in a cab that size. If you're going to, you know, if, if the curb weight is going to be roughly that of the Model X, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of design challenges. I mean, I, I agree so much with what Ian said, and it, it's 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 getting us to think. And I'm sure those of you who are watching or listening, you're sort of going, "Hmm, that's interesting stuff too." And um, it it really, I would love to be a fly on the wall in those rooms where they're trying to somehow <laughs> would, tackle these challenges and be we like, all <laughs> I, right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just it's a it's yeah. Uh, it's this is a great conversation, but I'll be honest, I have no freaking idea what we're talking about well kind of going back on what i said before when i showed when i put this picture up you know this is a big truck right this was the concept that they they drew out and they said oh well you know it's you know we just used the tesla cab uh the tesla semi cab on this thing that i'm kind of going back and thinking about this if they're actually going to do a six passenger cab you'd think it has to be pretty big because most trucks on the market these days, they're, they're still using, well, some of them have bench, well, back in the 70s, it was all bench seats in the front, right? And now they're largely, um, and my brother used to have a truck, and it was uh, two jump seats in the back. They folded down. It was mm-hmm. one of the small Mazdas or something. I forget what it was. That was a long time ago. Anyway. Um, Sorry to hear that. <laughs> hey, but, those are not bad trucks. No, I'm, no uh, I'm not saying the truck. I'm just saying, like, imagine the guy going, all right, Brian, sit in the back seat. Well, Come on! I mean, it was, I want to be the jump seat guy. No, it was Mazda branded, but it was a it was a it was a Ford underneath. Um, anyway, so if you look that's at all, the truck, all he could afford. Yeah, if you. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Good night, good night, everybody. I'll see yeah. you later. <laughs> 
But just getting back to what I was saying, I mean, if you think about the trucks these days, they're, they're largely captain seats in the front with a big tunnel in the middle because that's, you know, the drivetrain's got to go through there. And in the back, it's anywhere from two to three seats. So largely they're five seat. So if they're going to do six, either the cab has to be bigger to accommodate, say, two in the back or, you know, two and two two rows in the back, or some kind of bench seat in the front. Now, the bench seat would be easy to do on a Tesla because you get a flat floor because of the battery, right? So many, so many things you can dream up, right? If you're just, you know, just sitting there, you don't have an idea what they're doing. Uh, it's easy to take these numbers and say... Hey, you know what they might do, Trev? Maybe they'll that? do like the McLaren and they'll have like the driver in the center, like take the semi layout mm -hmm. and just put a seat on either side, you know? that That is a possibility. I mean, again, you go back to this picture, that's exactly what they did because they just mm -hmm. used this, the semi cab on there. And yep. the cab, actually, for those of you who who, has, who haven't seen the interior of the, of the uh, Tesla semi, they have a, uh, so the driver is in the middle of the cab rather than being off to one side or another. Um, there's a lot of ramifications of why they did that, um, but there is a secondary seat, and it's a jump seat on the wall at the back, and it folds down, so it's kind of neat. Anyways, you can look it up at the Tesla reveal thing last year. <sighs> Anything else we want to... I mean, this has been a fun exercise. I'd like to do more of this stuff maybe in the future as as we get more um, products from what Tesla's talking about. I just thought it was kind of neat to, to start talking about this because Elon seems to be pretty keen on this new project that he's working on, so I thought it would be fun to um, just kind of you know, shoot the breeze a little bit, pull out some some mm -hmm. data, and and see where the market is, and whether we think it's it's you know it's ripe for you know some kind of disruption or some kind of incumbent or or not incumbent but a new company to come in and say, look, um, what if we did it this ways and it does it make sense? So I'm I'm actually really looking forward to seeing what he's going to pull out of his hat, and uh, which brings us to the other part is uh, any idea as to when we're actually going to see the prototype of this thing. My personal opinion, and I'll just give it out there first. I don't think we're going to see this thing for a couple of years at least. I, I'm I'm, probably, I'm thinking maybe like four or five years four or at five? the earliest. Ian, wow, that far out? No, I would have given it uh, three. I was hoping for like may maybe late 2020 we'd see at least the very initial prototype. You know, mm -hmm. early 2021. Uh, yeah, I'm, I got three years. Yeah, I think. I think. I think <laughs> once. I don't know. It's. I mean, you're shooting. You're, you're throwing well, darts at the wall we, here with this company. Well, right? I know, but we know that they've at least started whiteboarding as of June or early July, yeah. at least. I mean, whiteboarding is one thing, and you know that Franz is working on sketches. So, mm -hmm. at what point do you actually start saying you lock it down? You say, okay, this is what we're going to attempt, and then you throw it to the engineering, and then you start working, iterating, iterating, iterating. We know that Tesla went from sketches on the Model Three to start a production in about two and a half years. I mean, yep. that's insanely fast for the car industry. Most cars take five, six years to, you know, to design from scratch. And most of them, you know, in a lot of ways, they're just iterative anyways. I mean, when they say the all new 2019, well, it's not really all new. They changed the headlights and they changed the... 6% the... new. Yeah, exactly. Truth you know? in advertising. Exactly. We added some blue accents to the steering wheel. It's so nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We changed the door handles. It's a new model, right? GM it's used to be... pretty. GM was the worst offender at that. They would compete against themselves. Um, but yeah, as far as them iterating, they're very fast in the industry compared to everybody else. Uh, yeah, you can design a new scratch design project, but it takes five to six years to do that. Mainly, and I don't mean to denigrate Tesla on this, is because the other car companies spend an inordinate amount of time on testing their cars before they go yes. into production. Hmm. Um, Tesla basically... I don't want to say rushes a car to market, but they do all the engineering on the hardware. And because the cars are largely software, they put it out as a beta product. And mm -hmm. we know from the Model 3 that it's gone through a lot of changes um, since they started production. I mean, the seats have changed. The lights have changed. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's changed. I, I do want to posit one idea here. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that the example of the Model 3 production time frame is really great, but they already built a successful sedan beforehand. So if, if you're taking your flagship vehicle, and again, this is just purely my speculation, but if you built your first flagship vehicle and you're going to go, we're going to build one kind of like it, a little smaller, a little different, but we're going to do that. It's not difficult because you had a lot of the framework, a lot of the, the patent designs are sort of already there. What vehicle do they currently have? It's like a pickup truck. They have nothing. There's nothing in their line. Even the semi truck itself is a whole different vehicle than a pickup truck. I and mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't hear Ford going, "Hey, these uh, these class of trucks we have right here are really nice." But have you seen this big effing thing over here? Look at this! Isn't it amazing? They're not the same thing. Uh, so so I do think that because this is a, such a new vehicle for them, 
uh, and it, it's going to be different. And we read through this laundry list of stuff. I think Trevor is reading these things for about an hour and a half already. <laughs> um, but there's such a long list of things that they want to have the truck, hopefully, fingers crossed, out the out the gate in the prototype. I, I still I still think with so much they have coming up now uh, with the Y production, with the semi, with the Roadster, I, I just and the Roadster we're not planning on seeing at the earliest till 2020. I, I, I still think the the truck. All right. Maybe f- five is being excessive, but I still think four is probably the closer time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's there's a lot for them to tackle. And then, you know, even in said. There, there's a lot here we got to look at. We got to, we got to figure this all out. So it's, <laughs> we'll, we'll see where they go. But I, I think four years is, is probably more realistic. But again, we're, we don't know what we're talking about. We're just a bunch no. of guys on the internet. <laughs> no, we are. This is a total, total speculation shoot. <laughs> it's a crap shoot. Yeah. Well, the, yes. You know, the Tesla engineers know best, right? So the people that say, well, they should do this or they should do that. Well, the, you're an armchair engineer. The, the, you know, let the PhDs figure this out. <laughs> Well, you know why I'm at least a little bit optimistic and why I went with the three-year number is just the raw enthusiasm coming from Elon. I mean, if he's really cranked up about this, I don't think there'll be any running. You, you won't be able to escape. If you're an engineer on this project, he's going to be like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where's the next phase? You know, like, how are we at the chassis? What's happening with the adaptive suspension? No, no, no. Like, I mean, I just think he's going to be all over it because that seems to be what's turning his crank right now. So. Mm-hmm. Well, on that thought, uh, maybe we should just call it a night. And uh, oh. <laughs> we, by the fun. way, if you if you we could have done an entire show just on that podcast. Yeah, we could have on on Karis podcast. He covered so much stuff with his his stuff on Twitter and the press and the vehicles and SpaceX and all kinds of stuff. Like that alone is his own show. Well, we don't need to analyze that. If you want to listen to that podcast, feel free. We're just taking a little bit of that, and we're just kind of doing our own thing, just to, just to mix it up a little bit, just to see what's going on. Uh, so much going on. Well, uh, just closing thoughts. Uh, where can people... Uh, oh, by the way, I want to mention one thing here. If um, and, and I want to encourage people to, um, to reach out to us. Um, if you'd like to send us in questions for our panel or want us or you have any ideas for what we'd like to talk about um, send us an email you can you can reach me on the forum uh, just send it out over Twitter if you want and um, uh, we'd like to hear from you if you think there's something that that we should discuss or uh, some ideas that you you'd like or um, you just want to send in a question whatever knock yourself out go go right ahead we'd love to, to have some more interaction with that so having said that, uh, where can uh, we find you, Eric, on the internet if people want to chit-chat with you? So if you want to find me on the internet, uh, you could look under the M3OC forums, but I'm, I'm basically like that fly on the wall. I'm in there, but I'm not really around. Uh, the best place to find me is on Twitter at ECFIX, that is E-C-F-I-X. And right now I am running a special. I'm giving away a buy one, get one free survey on my Twitter account. Um so if you get a chance, go on to my Twitter feed, and I have this awesome survey now, uh, essentially asking, based on our conversation tonight, which of these uh, upcoming vehicles from Tesla excite you the most? Uh, we have the Model Y, the Semi, the Next Gen Roadster, and the pickup truck, uh, which, again, we dove really deep into the pickup truck, so deep that I think I'm on the other side of the Earth's crust. Um, <laughs> but as of right now, uh, the poll will be open for our next show uh, on November 15th. Uh, but right now, the Model Y and the pickup truck are tied at 38% with 21 volts. Mm-hmm. Uh, cast so again 21 votes uh let's try to get the number up but uh interesting Absolutely. results so far so i'll, I'll, that's re- I'll retweet it for you we'll get some activity on it sure. hey america thanks you <laughs> right great uh ian your turn where can people find you if they want to chit chat with you uh on twitter you can find me at ian pavelko uh for the precise spelling see the show notes uh trevor's always good enough to put it up there uh on the model three owners club forum um I am not as present as I would like to be uh, these days, although I'm really trying to focus on wheel and tire issues, as that's my speciality. So if you have any questions about that, I usually try to keep an eye on the uh, the threads that are talking about wheels and tires. Do not be shy to uh, private message me. I always try to respond to every PM within 24 hours on any questions you have about wheels and tires or anything else for that matter and um finally if you are interested in one of the evolve wear shirts i think mr camacho i'm has wearing one. mine tonight um, weapon of mass oh, adoption. Look at the two of you are i'm not wearing one yeah, but uh, yes the weapons of mass adoption that's the new one um i love it 
yeah, I, I, I had a lot of fun with that one. That was that was kind of a cool idea. But anyway, it's you, so soft. It's so soft. Yes, it's the finest material available from Teespring. So if you go to teespring.com and uh, look up Mad Hungarian Evolve Wear, uh, you'll run into it. And uh, in the case of the Evolve shirts, those for all of their existence, uh, the profits are being donated to um, three different organizations, to Plug in America, to uh, Electromobility Canada, which is uh, an umbrella for a bunch of different EV groups in Canada. And finally, to my friends here at LAVEC, the Association de Véhicules Électriques de Québec. So um, $6 from every single one of those shirts will go to these organizations. And we've hit, I think, we're closing in on 600 shirts, believe it or not, oh, wow. so, so far. Yes, yes. I, and I, I just sent out the donations from the 500 shirt I think six weeks ago or something like that. So thank you all very much for supporting this. this is, you excellent. know, it's really encouraging to see the community come together to support this. That's awesome. And the reason why they're so soft is because they're actually made from Ian's hair. <laughs> 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 yeah, you can see stock is running short. We might have a problem soon <laughs> with inventory. So deliveries might be a little um, a little stretched these days. <laughs> that and the Canadian strike. Yeah, all oh, yes, workers, the workers, yes. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both of you for being on the show. As usual, you guys are very entertaining. It makes for a really good, fun show every Thursday <laughs> as much as we can get in there. Well, we uh, amuse ourselves. I hope everybody else is amused. <laughs> I that also really want to say thank you to our sponsors. That's Fine Lab, Dulaband Insurance, and Evanex. These guys are really great. Thank you much, uh, very much for your sponsorship. It really helps. If you'd like to find me, you can find me on the internet. My uh, Twitter handle, that's the, where I'm most active um, as far as social media is concerned, and the handle's at Model3Owners. Don't forget to check out the forum. That's Model3OwnersClub.com. Keep those numbers up. We really love it. The uh, forum is, is growing like crazy. I'm very thankful for that, for everybody to be on board. Lastly, I also also want to say uh, a big thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors. Those guys really make the show happen. So if you want to check it out, throw us a couple bucks or something. Uh, you can find that at patreon.com forward slash Model 3 Owners Club. And lastly, hey, you still get a chance to get six months of free supercharging. If you use our referral code, you can find that uh, in the video description. Uh, or you can give it to your service advisor. It's Trevor41818. And every little bit helps to get you the free supercharging and gets this dude a little closer to a roadster. That's it for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for joining in, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching and listening. See ya. Goodbye, everybody. Bonsoir.